I'm Harry Croto. After 25 years trying to understand how some of the building blocks of the universe are made, I've been fortunate that my passion has led to a Nobel Prize. I believe that chemistry has an amazing power to explain the world around us. But in this film, I'll be pushing it to its limits, as I use it to help answer one of the deepest questions human beings have ever asked themselves. How did life begin? Our search for an answer will reveal how our lives are linked to the fate of stars. From the heart of distant stars, we'll plumb the depths of the Earth's oceans, looking for the cooking pot of life's early chemistry. And we'll journey back in time an incredible three and a half thousand million years to meet the ancestors. Strange molecules that are the source of all living things. If the distance between these two flags represents the time since the Earth formed four and a half thousand million years ago, then the period of recorded history, about 5,000 years, is represented by half the thickness of this coin. And a human lifespan, only about a hundredth of that. And we know something about the remarkable things that have happened from then till now. For instance, about here, humans invented tools. And if we go not that much further to about where this cow pat is, the dinosaurs, they disappeared. But really complex life forms like us and the dinosaurs have only been around for about the last 500 million years or so. Strange as it sounds, the bulk of the history of life has been dominated by very simple single cell life forms like bacteria. This much we know. But what we don't know much about yet is what happened about here, three and a half thousand million years ago. At that incredibly long time ago, the first living things appeared. But how? How on earth did life actually begin? There was a time when the answer seemed obvious. But it was a far-fetched explanation that we'd have difficulty accepting today. The ancients believed that living things appeared by spontaneous generation. This means living things grew out of non-living things. For example, when people saw maggots on putrefying meat, they thought the meat itself had spontaneously turned into maggots. Or they believed that rags could be magically transformed into mice. Such beliefs were widely held until one of science's greatest heroes proved it wrong. In 1860, the French Academy of Sciences offered a reward for someone to finally settle the issue of spontaneous generation. Was it true or not? Up stepped Louis Pasteur, one of the most eminent scientists of the day. This famous Frenchman is best known for his work on vaccination and giving us pasteurization. These achievements have overshadowed the fact that he put paid to the idea of spontaneous generation. And this he did very simply using curious flasks like this with this S-shaped neck. He poured a clear meat broth into a pair of these flasks. He boiled them both to ensure that any life already in there was well and truly dead. Then he left the flask sitting out with the end of those S-necks open to the air. Pastor waited and he waited. According to spontaneous generation, both flasks should have been crawling with life by now. But even after three years, there was nothing, no sign of life. Then came Pasteur's pièce de résistance. He took one of the two flasks and gave it a good shake. This shaking dislodged the years of dust that had settled in the esnec. The dust was now in the broth. Within two days, the shaken flask had changed color, while in the other flask, things were still the same. The broth inside this flask had turned cloudy because countless millions of microorganisms carried on the dust had started growing in it. Pasteur concluded that these tiny living things already existed on the dust and had not spontaneously generated in the broth inside the flask. 
He'd proved that life didn't generate spontaneously, and he'd done it just like that. Pasteur's prize-winning experiment freed us from the myth of spontaneous generation. It didn't tell us how life began. If life didn't come from nothing, as people had thought, then it had to come from somewhere. But where? The challenge of answering this question led some scientists to propose an even more imaginative solution. Perhaps life actually didn't start on the Earth at all. Perhaps it actually started up there. The heavens have inspired answers to many questions. And so perhaps it was inevitable that scientists began to wonder whether some sort of primitive life forms might have arrived on Earth from outer space. Certainly, that was what one Swedish chemist thought. His name was Van Terrenius. A hundred years ago, he proposed a theory which captured the imagination of his contemporaries. It was called panspermia, which means seeds everywhere. Followers of panspermia believe that space is teeming with microscopic life forms and that these tiny living things travel through the cosmos, cocooned inside meteors or sheltered in the interstellar dust clouds. The theory goes that a few of the seeds made it to the Earth. Et voila! Life. But did life really crash land onto the Earth three and a half thousand million years ago? It's a perfectly respectable theory, and it's well worth considering. But there are two main reasons why I personally don't like it. The first is, there's no hard evidence to support it. And the second is, it avoids the fascinating problem of how a bunch of primordial atoms and molecules flickered into life in the first place. Although I am not a believer in panspermia, I do believe that space has had a vital part to play in the origin of life, just not in the way that Arrhenius imagined it. For it wasn't living things that arrived from space, it was something else. <laughs> 